it's good to have, good to have plans for your model um, to anticipate where it might go. But um, we might learn from Dwight Eisenhower, who said once, plans are nothing, planning is everything. Clausewitz, the, the famous um, military strategist from Prussia, once commented that um, that no plan survives contact with the enemy. Um, and it's the planning process, just as much as it's, it's not so much the plan, it's going through the process of thinking through the plan, developing the plan, prioritizing, asking what do we know, what do we not know, reflecting on it, coordinating around it. That's what gives enduring value. And I might add, it's the same thing with modeling. It's not the model so much as the modeling, which confers value. If the model itself were to vaporize, the fact that you had built it puts you far further ahead because of the thinking, the meeting of the minds, the, the discussion, the reflection, the learning that's gone into it means any replacement model will be much more savvy. And so it's good to have an idea about where your model's going, but you don't get beholden to that. You're not a slave to that. You learn along the way, a little bit, you learn from, you start simple. And um, so we learn by looking at the structure and reflecting and and that may prioritize things. The stakeholders based on the structure may prioritize. The stakeholders may see output from the model and get challenged the model or get excited and want to have certain directions they want to take it or that that dynamics that often is unexpected or at least not something we directly anticipate. That takes us in a different direction. And the reason we do this with software and small bits is also as someone like uh, Asia would know from uh, 371 or Babs, is that when we add small bits into a program, into in software development, if there's a problem, we know more quickly where it came from because we've only changed a small bit, right? We've only changed this much. So if something unusual starts happening that's adverse in software development, we discover some new system trouble incidents, STIs, you know, with, with the issue, or, or we, um, we see some problems with usability come in. We, we know sort of what changed that could have contributed to that, right? Um, and you may uh, remember that from 371 as well. With, so with modeling, it's even more so, because with modeling, we have the risk of bugs. We have the risk of, of errors coming in. But um, a lot of what happens in modeling surprises us anyway. And so if we have a surprise, we have to figure out, or in other words, you know, is this uh, a problem with the implementation? I had a certain idea in mind and I, I did something silly. I put times instead of plus. I did a divide instead of a time, something like that. Right? Um, or is it a problem with the design? My, my plan for the model was off. And it's not the problem that I implemented the plan wrong, it's the plan was off. I, I thought we kind of characterize the contact process like this, but it turns out there's a logical problem with that, um, logically. It's not, it's not just I wrote the wrong code after it. Or it could be a problem, it, it could actually not be a problem, it could be immersive behavior that I didn't anticipate. And it's not a problem at all. In fact, it could be, a delightful thing to discover because emergent behavior, learning about it is often helps our thinking, right? It's one of the reasons we build the model to think more clearly through the situation. By seeing new emergent behavior, we often learn something. And when we, so when we add to a model and an experiment more, we do so incrementally, partly because we need to, we need to proceed in small bits to tease out, you know, when we see new behavior, what three classes are, is this in? Is it an implementation problem that leads to this unexpected behavior? Is it a design problem with the model plan? Or is it a 
a problem with, uh, or is it just uh, a problem with our thinking that we didn't realize there was emergent behavior that would result and we learn from the model with that behavior. So it's even arguably more important with, with um, models to proceed in small, small increments than with software. And with software too, when we proceed in small increments, um, we do so partly because we can go to the stakeholders sometimes and get feedback, get new feedback, get new prioritizations about what the next important feature is. And because we always want something close to deliver, um, close to delivery. Uh, so if the stakeholder wants to demo it or see it or talk about it with a with a colleague, um, uh, it'd be nice if we can facilitate that process. With modeling, my colleague Jeff McDonald, who's um, one of my esteemed uh, colleagues, kind of a philosopher of modeling. Um, from Australia, he um, uh, he speaks about models. You should never have a model more than thirty minutes from being able to run. Is is his is his advice from decades of uh, of modeling in the trenches, and I emphatically agree. Um, you always want it close to running because it's through running that we learn. And sometimes we spot issues that are problems with the implementation or problems with the model flattening of design, um, what we intended to, to have as our sort of description of the world. But sometimes it's we learn about emergent behavior and that makes us more savvy. So you may have your plan for where you want your model to go, the bigger, better model you're working towards late in the semester then. But as you work in the semester, it'll naturally time box it. It will naturally limit what you're doing. And by developing incrementally, you'll always have something in hand that you can hand in. Um, but beyond that, um, you will be learning. And you may arrive at a suitably you know, rich model beyond what you started with, but it'll be richer in a very savvy way because you will have learned along the way, okay? So that was um, a soliloquy, uh, which can't compare to those of the Bard, but I did want you to, uh, to make note of, okay? Um, this issue of incremental delivery and modeling, iterative delivery. I prefer to speak of agile modeling. And for those who have taken 370 and 371, you'll have a sense of why I use that term stakeholder embedded, incremental and iterative, and um, subject to sort of ongoing feedback and reshaping, reprioritization along the way. Learning. Um, so we build our models in incremental ways. We iterate to learn along the way and to, to, build, to build a better model but to do better modeling. Okay. Um, so those were some comments in response, but I, I think the pine beetle infestation is a is a fantastic topic to explore. Um, uh, there's a esteemed colleague of mine at University of Buffalo, um, uh, and she uh, uh, she works uh, with HMA. She worked for her. Master PhD doctoral work with um, my late colleague Mark Page, um, another great thinker in the modeling area, uh, who uh, who is interested in uh, the Emerald Ash Borer, which south of the border is um, a devastating uh, beetle that infests uh, ash trees and has doomed a lot of. Um, a lot of urban forests in the US. Uh, and uh, they had a very nice geospatial model and any logic. Um, uh, Sarah Metcalf is her name, anyone can look her up. Um, she did that at University of Illinois. Um, but yeah, this is a wonderful model. And um, uh, I will not, I know, know that also duck elm disease is another example of this. I talked in an inter interesting series of conversations one of the folks responsible in Saskatoon for guarding against 
um, uh, against um, Dutch Elm disease intrusion into our city. And they have, you know, policing of firewood that goes on and trying to make sure that our elms, which are pearls, you know, uh, rare refugia from an earlier era, um, can be preserved. Uh, uh, for, for those not familiar with it, you may you may have admired. Perhaps you didn't even notice since it's so familiar to you the the tree canopies that uh, you can see in some areas near the university, particularly of Dutch of, of elms um, on some of the avenues, particularly the avenues running uh, east west uh, near the university. Uh, uh, these have wonderful sort of almost um, canopy structures that extend, uh, you know, with the elms reaching up and, and almost meeting above the street. And uh, if you go for most areas in North America, and particularly in the U.S., they used to have canopies of trees like that, but they've been lost through these infestations. And so, anyway, I cannot speak enough about the importance of these sort of investigations. And it has it has ecological impact and it has economic impact on the, the forestry industry, et cetera, and, and VC. So I, I think it's a really fun topic. Yeah. So my uh, my hat is off to you. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um great. Um so those are some comments on incremental modeling. Any questions about that? Incremental modeling? You, for those wondering, is that quizable? Is it examinable? Darn right. Um, so make notes. It's a really important part of um, of modeling know how. Uh, any questions on that issue of incremental development? Yeah, yes, it's yes, not tangential, but like with software engineering, like what kind of demands are there for like model refactoring and model maintenance? Like, is there a whole world of Awesome question. Awesome question. Um, modelers come from many backgrounds. People who do, in, in my view, I'm going to be very clear, it takes a, a village to build an impactful model. When I say that, I mean people from a very different background. It takes the main stakeholders, uh, people with lived experience sometimes uh, of, of the conditions being uh, at issue. Um, uh, often domain experts, maybe physicians or maybe scientists with, with particular knowledge, social scientists, as well as, you know, the people who are skilled in the art of description of real world processes, which is really a lot of this point, how we use these tool sets of agent-based modeling, system on the next model, the stock and flow, and today we call the loop diagram. And with discrete event simulation, these workflows and resource limited flow and, and so on. Um, folks who have that language, I might describe sometimes as the modelers, but don't please don't 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 think it privileges them and the team because impactful modeling comes from from bringing to bear a huge range of different knowledge in modeling and good modeling just like good software engineering, strives to bring in the knowledge and experience of many parties and to make models transparent so that you can welcome those critiques and that, that knowledge. And, and much of our work lies at this intersection of kind of software engineering, building, building tools to help build models so that they are transparent and comprehensible to people from many different backgrounds. Um, and it's one of the reasons we do causal loop diagramming because you can teach people about how to do causal loop diagramming who may not even have high school education within a short enough period of time they can engage and they can challenge your diagram, critique it, extend it. And there's proof positive of this. Um, but you were saying with uh, software engineering, there are these additional processes that come in such as refactoring, for example, um, reworking um, processes of continuous integration, processes associated with testing or mocking. Um, and all those have and 
it's wise to pursue their analogs in the modeling context with models at scale, with models that are created um, with enough scale that these things start to become important. And often um, those are underinvested in, and often the tools aren't designed to really support it well. For example, any logic is terrible, terrible at, at, at supporting model testing. I, I mean, it, it, it's miserable. It's, it's, it's horrendous um, uh, in its impoverishment of support for model testing. Um, it's also not very good at integration of models with, um, with the contemporary uh, version control, with, with Git, and being able to merge, merge models together. I mean, it's, it's horrendous. It's, yeah, um, I could use stronger terms, but I have to limit my my, my vocabulary uh, accordingly. Um, so uh, uh, when it comes to peer review in its place, for example, peer review has huge role in soft development, whether it's through pair programming and there's pair modeling. Uh, you know, reviews of pull requests, right? Um, should have their analog in the modeling sphere. Um, uh, formal inspections of code bases or portions of code base have their analog and formal inspections of models. Um, and uh, model mocking is sometimes known as partial model validation and sort of uh, iteration there where you substitute sometimes empirical data for a portion of your model. You replace a portion of your model with some data you have from that portion. So you kind of de-endogenize it, you put an exogenous information there instead of the endogenous, instead of producing it, the model telling you, you tell it to the model and you work with the rest of the components of the model and then you add it in. And there's a whole process of successive model calibration. And so generally speaking, as the, someone who, who teaches, sometimes in this very room, software engineering, with some here having uh, been veterans, one might say victims of that of that teaching. Um, uh, I would say that those processes, you do well to ask about best processes in software engineering. Why can't we have that in modeling? Or what could that look like in modeling? Or what does that look like in modeling? And that is an area of rich and fertile um, uh, opportunities for, for for research contributions and practical contributions for modeling tools. And it is to that purpose that our lab bends its back and some of our lines of work. Yes. Um, okay. So you were saying that um, if you want to, like, instead of the, the model showing you what it should do, you can tell the model what it should. Yeah. Does that by extension mean like if you were to write something to show the model how to do, you can kind of just reverse it and then the model would tell you? Well, um, I spoke a little bit quickly there, but the the idea is that sometimes when we're characterizing systems in the world um, that are larger, um, we build models to characterize them that consists of, and I'm going to ask for the kind um, DAs here, um, with the, well, I'll be, um, yeah, so, um, thank you. I'm glad I have an SSD drive. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry, Ubuntu 24.04 has experienced an internal error. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes the analog world mixes with the digital one in unfamiliar ways. Um, okay. Um, if that's the worst of it, I'm, I'm, I'm not that bad. I'm really interested what internal error it has. But the recording continues nonetheless. It'll be an interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> The goal is to have it see the board. Is that what yeah, yeah, goal? that was that was my goal. Um, this this room is not recommended by profuse electrical connections, and hence I have a tendency to trip over this one. That's probably not the first time in the history of the universe that that's happened. In fact, I recall some other incidents. Maybe oh, aha. Uh -huh. Pardon me. 
problem solved. Okay. Um, moving right along. This is why I put that. <laughs> yeah. I will note because uh, I want it to be drawn this board from that. You can see that. Yeah. So I'm going to ask the TAs to take a photo. I was but I don't want to disenfranchise you amongst other people on this side of the room. And I try to strive for equity in terms of using the people's um, conscious. And in this case, the question originated in this side. You know, I would do a disservice if you to that someone put it on over there. But often when we characterize the system, we we, we we have a model characterizing it, which is interconnected. Um, it's a coupled system, as systems in the world are. There are influences that spread between these. But as Jenna could tell us, our stalwart TA, our, our intrepid TA, um, you know, often there are, there, I mean, there are almost invariably interfaces between these things where information flows back and forth from modules from certain areas of the model. And uh, there are times where this information is purely latent. It's not a, uncommon. And so where you don't have data on this, but there are other times where you actually do have some information. Alas, the, the, uh, Making progress. Oh, okay. 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 Well, um, I would agree. Um, so there are times where we actually have some sort of information about this and are, are interested in endogenizing and making a model of it is that um, I'm using different colors to denote different types of information. Um, the, int the, the interest is in endogenizing, creating a model of it is, amongst other things, we can ask what if question, how would it be different under different conditions? But to the degree we have data about it historically, we can sometimes kind of mock out a portion of this model um, for model testing or for model, model uh, calibration purposes and, and substitute in empirical data for this. Um, and that might allow us to calibrate other portions of the model. And then later we'll come, having calibrated those, uh, calibrate this one, for example. And there's different ways of, of conducting this, but uh, generally there, there are times where it can be useful to, if, if you have an area of the model that interfaces with others through observable data, data it can be useful to think flexibly about, hey, could I sometimes substitute that out sort of drive, feed that empirical data to other areas of the model, observe their behavior, um, and you know, basically work with and refine those without having to worry about you know, refining the internal dynamics of this one, and we'll come to that later. So I hope that's helpful a little bit. Um, uh, in, uh, that was Pam, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, does that help? Help a bit. Okay. Great. Um, any other questions about these sort of things? Oh wow, yeah, there was there was um, some physical alterations of the frame computer as well. Um, it has a less um, angular frame. Um, it, it's some edges are notably smooth and rounded. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions? I think we've lost our HDMI. So I think with those comments, I will stop this and I'm going to transition to the primary goal here of the